Jerry. Jerry. Oh, thank you. Eighth graders, welcome to High School Sunday Night. We have a special spot for you. If you could come up over here, this is where we've reserved four rows for you guys. The so eighth graders, set your stuff down right here. Leave your Bibles, your stuff, and then you can join us in worship. So eighth graders, these first four rows are for you. All right, welcome to High School Sunday Night. Oh, hi. Okay, first, let's give a big warm welcome to our eighth graders. All right, eighth graders, so this is High School Sunday Night. You have, you're really close to graduating to up here. And all we wanna tell you on behalf of the RPM band is this is way well not way better but this is a step up from junior high sunday morning we have the layout's different everything's different and uh yeah we hope y'all have a blast so let's go ahead and get into worship
up onto my feet Your way is the only way for me It's a narrow road that leads to life And I want to be on it It's a narrow road and the mercy's why Cause you're good on your promise and I'll take you at your word If you say it, I believe it I've seen how dirty it works If you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word You spoke in the cave fell in the light Oh, I know Cause I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road that leads to life And I want to be on it It's a narrow road to the tide inside But you're part of the world He's good on our promises, even through everything we're going through, um, if it's school, if it's stuff at home, we know that God's there. Even if we can't see him in that moment or we feel like we can't feel him, he's working in our lives. And let's just, let's just stand strong in that as we continue worshiping, as we continue through tonight and as we continue through this week. Let's just remember that we can take him at his word and that he's good on his promises always and forever.
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad because I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful.
And hope my words fall away I've got nothing new How could I explain Oh my gratitude I could see me so as I often do But every song must end And you never do So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a heartless Nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah And I've got one response I've got just one my arms stretched wide I will worship you So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah a
Welcome to high school Sunday night. Go ahead and take a seat, everybody. There's a lot more people tonight because we have our eighth graders tonight. So let's give it up for our eighth graders. Yeah. Eighth graders, we are so excited to have you here with us um, for a night and even more excited to welcome you to high school completely come August. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a rundown of what tonight is gonna look like. After I'm done with announcements, we're gonna have a senior testimony from Molly, and then Chris, woo! Chris is gonna come up and teach for us. I, oh, there it is. Chris is gonna come up and teach for us tonight, and then before going to breakouts, like y'all normally do for um, junior high, we're gonna have one more song of worship and then go to breakouts. Um, but we are so excited to have the 8th graders here with us tonight. A couple of announcements before we jump in. Um, one, we have band auditions that are coming up. So, yeah, if you're interested in being in one of the student worship bands, like the group that was just up on stage leading us so beautifully this morning, this, it's not morning, it's evening, this evening, <laughs> um, then you can talk to Jerry in the back, and Jerry would love to tell you more about what positions they're looking for for the bands. Um, so if you have any sort of musical talent, talk to your boy Jerry back there. Um, next Sunday, next Sunday is going to be a big Sunday, a really fun Sunday, and also a really sad Sunday too, um, selfishly. Uh, but next Sunday is Senior Sunday. So this group of seniors right here at the front, um, we are going to be celebrating them next week. Um, I know, they're so cute. Um, so next Sunday, there's not going to be junior high services like you normally have, because we want to encourage everyone to go to the, um, to go to celebrate seniors on Sunday morning. So that will be happening do, during the 11, 11 a.m. service um, to celebrate the seniors. And also next Sunday night, instead of Chris and I being up here and like doing all the things, it's actually going to be the seniors up here doing all the things. Um, so Stay tuned for what Senior, senior Sunday is going to look like next Sunday night um, because they're going to be the boss. So um, it's going to be awesome, and we are super excited to get to celebrate our lovely senior class. Um, but we're also really sad that we have to set them off. But we don't have to do that next week, so that's super great. Um, lastly, we have a senior testimony from our girl Molly. Come on up here, Molly. <laughs> Yay. Hey guys, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Molly. Um, I didn't really grow up in a super Christian home. As a kid, the only things I knew about Christianity were the Christmas and Easter stories. Um, that's truly because we moved a lot and we didn't really find a church home until we came to Grace. The first time that I remember individually praying to God was while I was laying in a hospital bed. My family had recently moved to Texas, leaving behind all of our friends and family in Missouri. This, of course, brought a lot of sadness and anxiety into my life. 
In August of 2018, things got especially bad for me. School had just started and I was having trouble fitting in as well as dealing with some mental issues. Um, this resulted in me developing an anxiety-induced eating disorder that really took over my life. I tried to hide it for a long time because I was embarrassed and I was hurting, but my parents quickly noticed that I wasn't just having trouble adjusting or getting sick randomly. They took me to specialist after specialist and I began to spend more time in the hospital. Being a teenage girl during all of this really gave me a lot of confidence and self-image issues and it made me pretty angry. I became more of an angry person. It was during that time that I remembered calling out to God and just asking, why me? Why is this happening to me? Um, I really begged God to end the pain by whatever means necessary. My life was at rock bottom for a while, but I continued to pray for God's grace and guidance. Towards the end of my eighth grade year, I met a girl who insisted I came to church with her. I was really hesitant at first, but I came and I began getting plugged into her church and even accepted Christ into my life. I kind of realized that that church wasn't the community that I wanted to be in, and I again like, closed myself off from any kind of church community, and without God-fearing people beside me, I made some bad choices in who I surrounded myself with. At the beginning of my sophomore year, though, some of my friends had invited me to come to high school Sunday night. I constantly made excuses and just said I would go another time. Finally, I decided to go, and it was the best decision I have ever made. I immediately met some of the best people and reaccepted Christ in my life. I began coming to small groups, getting involved with Christian groups at school, and really growing in connection with lots of those people. God truly brightened up so many areas in my life, and things started to get better for me mentally and physically. He rescued me from friendships that weren't glorifying him and removed any idols. As difficult as this change was, it made me so much stronger and allowed me to see how amazing it is to walk faithfully. Last summer, I made the choice to get baptized, and I expected my life to be just super easy, super calm, but I was really wrong. I have since lost loved ones, had to lead people to grow in my faith, and just kind of walked through life. Um, these experiences weren't ideal, but they made me so much stronger, and I learned to walk by faith and give up control, trusting that God has a wonderful plan for me. I began to truly glorify God in every situation. This year, God has opened up my eyes to how each trial over the last few years was part of a bigger plan. God was working in every situation. He brought me out of the valley and walked with me every step of the way. Jesus' sacrifice about, allowed my life to be completely turned around. He surrounded me with so many people who fill me up every day. I have truly found my family here, and I am so thankful for everything that led me here. God has recently given me the courage to get more involved in working to glorify him. I have found a passion in helping others and sharing good news of the Bible, and I plan to pursue that passion through college. I know that was long, but I want to leave you guys with a few takeaways. First, the Bible is constantly telling us to keep going, even when the reasons to keep going seem to get fewer and fewer. One verse that always motivated me to keep going is Psalm 34, 6, which says, When I had nothing, desperate and defeated, I cried out to the Lord, and he heard me, bringing his miracle deliverance when I needed it most. The last point that I want to leave you with is that no matter what you're going through or what you have been through, look around. There are so many leaders and students who would love to get lunch with you, attend a Bible study with you, or just meet up in the middle of the night to talk about how God is working in your life. Coming to God after so much pain has truly allowed me to see his glory, and it's amazing. God is so good, and you are never too broken or too used to be loved by him or used by him. Thank you. I'm going to pray. I'm also going to pray for Chris before he comes up to share his message. So, you guys would bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being a God that is so loving. Thank you for walking with us in the valley and on the mountaintop. Lord, I lift up every person in this room. I pray that you would be with them in whatever season of life they're experiencing. God, speak through Chris and let his words not be his own, but be yours. Let this message touch each person and bring them close to you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.
How are you guys? Good? That was tense, I know. Hey, 8th graders, welcome to High School Sunday Night. We're glad you are here. Uh, I'm glad you all pulled up. Uh, we're going to be studying Genesis chapter 22. We've been, as a group of high schoolers and I, we've been camping on Abraham's life. And so Genesis 22 is where we're going to be. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 22, starting verse 1. Uh, but as you're going there, let's, let me begin with the introduction. Uh, how many of you guys know exactly how many days of school you have left? Do you, any of you guys know? How many do you have left? School days. Huh. Ele- <laughs> I know some of you guys are counting down the days of when school is over, summer vacation is here, and so on. Um, how many of you guys are like, I was, how many of you all say like, I am burnt out right now because of school. Okay, yes, I see you, I see you, I see you. Uh, so one of, uh, one of the things I hated when I was in school uh, were, uh, maybe you guys agree, I hated, I like, I, I like school, but there's one thing that I hated, and that were tests. I like, I hate tests. I don't mind the homework or the reading, but tests I hated, only because they gave me anxiety. I was not a good test taker, and it's just uh, the worst. Um, anyone else like that? Like, I, like, the teachers, you guys are great. I know some of you guys are teachers here. Like, you guys are great, but I didn't understand, like, why would these mean teachers give us these tests? Um, and I was preparing for today's message. I was, like, Googling, and I found some uh, questions that appeared on a test, and I wanted to go over some of these funny answers that these kids, right, some of them are elementary kids, some of them are high schoolers, but in one history class, one of the test questions was, what ended in 1896? To which the student answered, 1895, right? Like, it's not, it's not wrong, it's correct, right? Uh, question number two, um, one elementary teacher gave her students a shapes test where they had to identify and name the different quadrilateral shapes. You know, like, is it a square or a rectangle? And one student, Little Hope, uh, she wrote the answer. She actually, go to the next slide right there. She actually gave them names, right? Like Kate, Bob, not our Hope Vaughn, uh, but a student wrote that. Number three, uh, in a high school cl- cl- science class, a teacher asked students to fill out, uh, and one of the questions fill in the blank to this test question. The first cells were probably, a high schooler wrote, <laughs> lonely, right? Uh, it's not wrong, <laughs> it's correct. Uh, last question, this was like, I was like, uh, should I write this or should I not, but I want to put it in here. Uh, in a health class, shh, in a health class, this question appeared on test. <laughs> what happens uh, during puberty to a boy, right? What happens, right, during puberty to a boy? I know some of your parents are like super anxious. Uh, a student wrote, a student wrote, he says goodbye to his childhood and enters adultery. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? I, I like that, adultery. Oh, man. He is definitely wrong. You do not enter adultery, adulthood. Um, all that's to say, okay, school tests, school tests are not fun, right? Like, they're not fun. They're hard, they're difficult, and sometimes painful, but we know we need tests, right? Like, we know we need tests. Like, imagine if you were to go to class and your teacher was like, hey, in my class, there won't be any tests, right? No quizzes, right? Just do your homework and you will get good grades. Some of you are smiling, like, oh my gosh, yes. You know why you're smiling? Because you're thinking, I don't have to try in this class. But tests are important, right? They prove and they show and they reveal whether you have mastered a certain topic. Like imagine if you went to, and like they're super, because like imagine if you go see a doctor and you found out this doctor has never passed his MCATs. Like he's never like passed, like he failed every one of his medical exams. Or imagine if you know you're in your car with your friend and like, yeah, I got, like you're driving in the car and you find out, like, oh, she failed her driver's license test. Like how would you feel if they failed this test? Yes, you would freak out. Um, Just like teachers, God also tests his people, but his motives aren't to see that if you're smart enough or if you're good enough, right? He actually has a deeper motive, and today in Abraham's final test, right? We see this is Abraham's final exam in Genesis 22. We're going to look and discover why does God test his people, right? 
Why does God test his people? Uh, so if you have your Bibles, we're looking at Genesis 22. Uh, we'll start in verse 1. Let's read this together. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham responded, he says, here I am. And God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the next morning, saddled his donkey, and took his two young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him to go. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Verse 6. And then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both went, to, so they both went together. Verse 7. And Isaac said to his father, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Isaac said, Behold the fire and the wood, for where is the lamp for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb of, for burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar, and there laid the wood and in, order, in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached for his knife, right, took, it, took his hands, to slaughter his son. All right. Wow. What a tough test. Right? Like, this is like a crazy test. Um, now, let's step back here. I've come to learn while doing student ministry, do you know the one thing your parents love to talk about? You guys. Like, anytime, if I wanted to, like, okay, there's a parent that I don't really know, I want to get to mingle with this parent, all you need to do is, like, hey, like, tell me about your daughter, Stephanie. And the parents are like, oh my gosh, Chris, let me tell you, blah, 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 and they'll tell me all the details. Not, this is not just the case with girl parents, but if you talk to some boys, like, hey, tell me what, like, Brennan is like, Chris, did you see his prom picture? Did he not look handsome? Like, look at it. And then they go on and on and on because every parent loves their kids. Like, parents could talk about you all day. Right? And so you see them, like, when they're taking pictures in the back, they're, like, zooming in on, like, here's my child, who cares about everyone else, right? Or when some seniors share their testimony, so, like, you don't think just the parents come, right? Like, calling the uncles, the grandpas, like, we'll fly you out of state to listen to my daughter talk about, right, about God. That's a good thing, right? Parents love you guys. But imagine how much Abraham and Sarah love their son Isaac. Pop quiz. How old was Abraham when Isaac was born? Correct. A hundred years old. Right? Um, Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. Right? And like imagine how much Abraham and Sarah love Isaac. And then out of nowhere God gives Abraham this impossibly difficult test. Right? Let's look back in verse 1 and 2. He says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, take your son. And God like, seems to like, just stick that little needle in there more. He says, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering. Now, what's interesting here is you see the word love in your Bible? Like, if you can, like, highlight that word. This is the first time the word love appears in the Bible. This is the first time the word love appears in the Bible. And that only shows the weight of the situation. How much Abraham loved Isaac. And God says, take your son, your only son, right, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and sacrifice him. Crazy. Now, I said earlier that Abraham loved his son, and then out of the blue, out of nowhere, God tested Abraham. But I was wrong. Because if you look in the scriptures, if you look in the Bible, God never does anything just out of the blue. He never just randoms like, you know what, I'm bored, let's pop quiz them. Right? You, sacrifice your favorite thing. Right? God doesn't ever do that. Like, there's always a motive and a reason for God doing everything. And in the case of Abraham, right, 
God is doing something specific, which leads to our first main point on why God tests his people. The reason why God gives tests is to prepare his people for greater purpose. The reason why God gives tests is to test his pe- to prepare his people for a greater purpose. Everyone say purpose. 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 Good. Now, if you would have asked Abraham at this time, before Genesis 22, like, Abraham, what would you say is your purpose in life? What do you think he would say? He would probably, like, be a good man, you know, love my wife. But one thing he would definitely probably say is that God probably created me to be the father of Isaac. Right? God created me to be the father of Isaac, of course. Right? In the Bible, there are various descriptors used to convey different characters or people in the Bible to talk about their characters and their qualities. So, for example, Jesus, a descriptor that often comes with him, he's like, he's the, the Lamb of God. Uh, the Apostle John, a descriptor that often appears in the Bible, is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Right? Uh, David, do we know what David is? Pop quiz again. David solid, A plus, right? David, the man after God's own heart. For Abraham, do you know what Christians and Jews call him? Like, what's his descriptor? Abraham, the father of, right? Someone said Moses? <laughs> the father of, right, faith, right? If you look in the Bible, when we, every time we talk about Abraham, we don't say Abraham, the father of Isaac. What we say is Abraham, the father of faith. Because when God created Abraham, he didn't create him just to be the father of Isaac. He created him to be the father of faith. A.W. Tozer says this, God never uses anyone greatly until he tests them deeply. God never uses anyone greatly until he tests them deeply. And God was testing Abraham to prepare him for his greater purpose to be the father of faith. So if you look in the Bible, if you look in previous chapters, uh, there are different tests that God gives Abraham, right? In Genesis 12, which is what I see, we have probably a chart, it's like the calling test. And this is when God calls Abraham to follow him. Abraham was 75 years old when Abraham responds, like, okay, I'll follow you. And what God was trying to, was the main question God was asking Abraham is, will you have faith in me? A few chapters later, it's the protection test, right? Abraham and Sarah goes into Egypt, and what, I think what God was trying to test Abraham is like, will you trust and have faith that I will protect you? Unfortunately, Abraham fails, right? He lies, he's like, no, 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 this isn't my wife, this is my sister, please, well, no. And he lies, he fails that test. Um, in Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot separate, and Lot gets the better land, and Abraham is like pro- feeling a little like, man, like, that was supposed to be my land. And the test is an eye test. It's where he's, God was testing Abraham. Like, Abraham, will you have faith in me even if you can't see? In Genesis 14, there's the money test when Abraham wins and takes all his money and he doesn't receive any of it. He actually gives 10% to King Melchizedek, right? All his money. And he's like trusting God. Like, God, you will be my financial provider, nobody else. In Genesis 15, it's the covenant test. We did this uh, two weeks ago when we had like a little animal sacrifice here. You guys remember high school? Like, right? right? You have to be there, right? We, we remember there was an animal sacrifice, and it was trying to show Abraham, God was testing, right? Abraham said, hey, we have faith in me that I will keep my covenant. Genesis 16 is the patience test where God's like, hey, I'm going to give you a son. Wait, promise son. And instead of waiting, Abraham and Sarah thought like, hey, Abraham, you should sleep with another person and have a child there. Fail. Um, and then Genesis 18, when Claire taught, it was the prayer test where Abraham was tested to intercede on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the question that God was asking Abraham is, will you have faith in my character and goodness? Now, just like any good teacher and professor that gives his quizzes to prepare them for the final exam, God was doing the same thing with Abraham to prepare him for his final exam, which is Genesis 22 right here. Like, we see Abraham, he does not hesitate at all in the video, he's like, he actually takes a knife and was willing to sacrifice his son. But we see his faithfulness being built up after each test, and even if you look at verse 3, it says, Abraham rose early the next day. Right? God gives this insane command, hey, I want you to sacrifice your son, and if it was me, I'm like, sacrifice my son. Like, sacrifice like my, the son, or like, I would have distracted or delayed this, but Abraham wakes up early to obey God. Right? Um, in verse 5, 
right? Did you catch what verse 5 says? It says, he, Abraham is talking to his servants, and he says, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy will go over there, right? We will worship, and then who will come back? We will come back. See, Abraham had faith that somehow Isaac is going to come back with me because I trust God's character. He's faithful. And we see, we don't see until Hebrews 11, right, thousands of years later in the book of Hebrews, where it reveals that Abraham reasoned with, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. You know what's crazy about this, though? Uh, up until now, you know how I, earlier I said, like, that was the first time love appeared in the Bible? Up until now, there's been no record of someone coming back to life. Like, for you and me, we believe, like, oh, yeah, God raised Lazarus from, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Oh, yeah, that's why we've heard stories that Jesus rose again from the dead. But up until now, no miracle like that has ever existed, and yet Abraham had faith. And then in verse 8, when Isaac asks, like, man, dad, like, where's the offering? God says, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. It leads to my second point. Listen, here's what God is doing during the test, right? He's not testing you right, to find out what you're made of. He's testing you to, so that you will find out what he's made of, okay? He's not testing you to find out what you're made of, whether you can do it or you can, whether you will be victorious or whether you fail. He's testing you to show you what he's made of, okay? By faith, Abraham trusted that God would do something and to make things right. He took his son to Mount Moriah, built an altar, and right when he's about to sacrifice his son, an an the angel stops Abraham, calling out to him, do not lay your hands on the boy, do not do anything to him, for I now know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son. If you go down to verse 15, it says, and then the angel of the Lord called out to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates uh, of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. If you look back, right, if you look back in chapter 22, in verse 11, highlight, if you see the, ver the verse, angel of the Lord, right? If you see angel of the Lord in verse 11, right, highlight that. Because... This wasn't just any angel that was stepping in the situation. It says what? It says, the angel of the Lord. Now, here's what's crazy in the Bible. We have no idea who this angel is. Right? Um, but in the Bible, there's different uh, titles um, to refer to this angel. <clears throat> uh, in some reference, you see an angel of the Lord appears. Other times, you see angels of the Lord appears. But there are a few times where the definite article, the, appears, and it says, the, the angel of the Lord appears. And what's interesting is, is whenever the angel of the Lord appears, this person speaks as if he is God. This person identifies himself as God, and this person exercises all the responsibilities and powers of God. And if you look at the next slide, these are all the references where the angel of the Lord appears, and every time he talks like he's God. He walks like he's God. He commands like he's God. And here's who I think the angel of the Lord is, and a lot of biblical scholars believe the same thing. I personally believe that the angel of the Lord is Jesus in the Old Testament. That Jesus appears in the Old Testament. Some of the scriptures that Jesus even says in John 8, 58, he says, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And you know what's really interesting? The appearance of the angel of the Lord, you know when it stops? In the New Testament. After Jesus comes into the picture, in the New Testament, there's no record of the angel of the Lord. Let's say, okay, well, we're not, we're not sure because nobody was there. So let's say this is Jesus. And you look at the Genesis 22. Is this not the gospel story? Right? Where Isaac is supposed to be sacrificed and Jesus intervenes. Right? We see there's a parallel between Jesus and Isaac, right? Both Isaac and Jesus were loved by their fathers. Right? Both 
were willing to sacrifice himself. Isaac, oftentimes when you hear this story, do you, don't you ever feel bad about Isaac? Like, man, I would hate to be Isaac. What, as scholars study, when they say he's a young boy, they say he could be anywhere between like 12 to 33. 33? Oh. Right, some of you got the reference. Both were, both were willingly offering themselves to sacrifice himself. Both carried wood as they went up to get sacrificed. Right? One was carrying wood. Jesus was carrying the cross. And then Mount Moriah, it's the exact, scholars think it's the exact same location where Golgotha was, where Jesus was sacrificed. Okay? But here's what different, is the difference between these two. One got spared. One got sacrificed. Okay? And if you look at this verse, right, if you look at this story, what if God had put Abraham in this story, put him in this situation, test him just so that we can later point to Jesus. Okay? What if God put Abraham in this situation so that he could point to Jesus? And then if you stop and reflect at your life and mine, whenever God puts a test in you, what if God placed that test in your life so that you can point to Jesus? This is why I love testimonies. Like, when you shared your testimony, like, in every testimony you hear, I love testimonies, like, the ones that, like, are victorious and the ones that fail. You know what the end, what the conclusion always is? Jesus is Lord. Like, I may have failed, but Jesus didn't. I was victorious because Jesus was first victorious. I am where I am because of Jesus. And all these testimonies, you hear them, they're tests. Sometimes we fail, sometimes we win, like Abraham. But in the end, whether we're victorious or whether we fail, all of our tests point to Jesus. And we see that countless of times in the Bible. Watch this next video, and we're going to see how each hero of the faith points to Jesus. Watch this next video. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. There is a true and better Jonah, who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, 
perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. As we close, as you guys in a few minutes are going to scatter or stay where you are, like, I would like for you to take some time and think about what test is God placing in your life today? What test is God placing in your life today? There's a quote that I found. It was so good. He says, a person asks, I ask God, why are you taking me through troubled waters? He's saying, God responded, because your enemies can't swim. Tests aren't easy, and it's really hard. But God is doing it and putting them in your life for a greater purpose. Prophet Jeremiah, uh, if you know, he's called the lamenting prophet. And at one point, he cries out to God, like, God, I want to quit. This is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. I don't want to be a prophet anymore. And you know how God responds? He says, if racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? Racing against mere men makes you tired. How will you race against horses? And I love that because you know what that means? God had something bigger for Jeremiah than what even Jeremiah realized. God had something bigger for Abraham than what even Abraham realized. God has something bigger than for something for you and me than even what we realize. So yes, earlier we talked about funny tests and we laughed about it, but I know some of you guys are going through real difficult tests right now. Maybe God has placed you there so that you could bring Jesus into your family. Maybe in your time where you feel alone, maybe God has placed that in your heart so that, you know, that test so that you can be victorious so that you can see other people who are alone and then bring them to Jesus. This test that you're facing right now, know that God has a bigger plan for you. Remember, when you ask, when I ask, what's your purpose? Whatever grand answer you give, God would say, ha, funny. I have something bigger in mind for you. So later you're going to go to breakout questions and you're going to talk about what kind of tests has God placed in your life. I would love you all to be honest with each other. And I would love you to pray for each other. And then I would love to also hope God and, and pray for yourself right now. Like, God, whatever test I'm in right now, what are you doing? What purpose is this test for me in my life? Help me to be faithful. Let's pray. God, thank you for these students who are here. God, thank you for using people like Abraham who have faced tests before us. And by becoming victorious, they become models of faith for all, the, for all of us here today. And Lord, I don't know what test that we are facing, but Lord, help us to be faithful, knowing that God, you never do anything out of the blue, but there's a specific reason, a, a greater purpose that you have in mind. So Lord, give us the strength to be faithful. Whether it's school, whether it's praying for our families, whether it's praying for our family, whether it's battling against sins, whatever it is, Lord, give us the strength to be faithful. Thank you. Love you. Jesus, I pray that even in this test, that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the room if you want to have a seat you can um, and we're going to do one more song of reflection so
Dear God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the tests and that you trust us to go through them and hold, hold fast to you. Lord, I don't know what all everyone is going through, but God, you do. You've met each and every one of us where we are. And Lord, I pray whether we're in the valley or on the mountaintop, what, wherever we are in our walk right now, in our faith, Lord, would you just make your presence known? God, that is true, what we just declared, that we want to know your heart. That is so true. All that we desire, Lord, the desire of our hearts is to know you, to know the greatest love the world has ever seen, to know what it's like to hold fast to you even though everything is screaming within us to let go, to hold on when it seems like we are surrounded and outnumbered. God, would we hold fast and be steadfast with you? And would it not be out of our own strength, but only through you? Because only you have the strength to get us through every, every water, every storm. This life was not made to be done without you. So Lord, I pray. I pray for endurance. And that endurance creates character, and character is what it takes to continue to walk with you, Lord. Lord, would we continue to hold fast to you? Not just because you're good and you're faithful, but because we love you. We want to know you more. I pray that we would continue to walk with you throughout our week, and that this zeal and this this revival of our spirits, God, that it would carry us through. Lord, would you make, would you indwell your spirit within us? And Lord, would we walk out knowing that we are completely covered by your blood, completely bought by your blood, and that we are free. We are free to walk knowing that every burden has been cast upon you and that we can always lean on you for every tribulation through every trial. We love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. Now we are going to go to a time of breakouts. So eighth graders, you're actually going to go back to the kids' building and do breakout in your normal room. Um, and then... Um, the rest of you guys, ninth grade girls are right here, ninth grade guys right there, sophomore guys, sophomore girls, junior girls are in that little hidden secret room back there, junior guys, you're off the lobby, seniors are upstairs. If you're not sure where to go, come up here and ask me and I'd love to point you in the right direction. Bye guys.